Every year, the NFHS Baseball Rules Committee and the NFHS Board of Directors release their points of emphasis for the season. Generally, these are meant to address issues in the game that they believe to be growing and that must be addressed by the coaches and umpires. As umpires, our understanding of the NFHS points of emphasis is critical. These points, which include malicious contact, profanity, and pace of play, are central to enforcing rules consistently and accurately. And we have to be consistent game to game with how the umpires that worked the game before us called it and how the umpires in the game after us will call it. This consistency established from game to game is how we make positive improvements to the sport. So in this video, we'll break down the points of emphasis and the relevant rules that you can use in your enforcement. Then afterwards, we'll review the case plays related to these rules. And if you wanna see how well you can do on the case plays before the review with me at the end of the video, you can find a link in the description. Hi everyone, Patrick Farber from GHSA Baseball Umpire Development and Umpire Classroom, where we help umpires develop their knowledge and skills. If you're new here, be sure to subscribe to our channel. And if you're looking for a packaged course for new umpires, either for yourself or for your association, you can find out more about our course at umpireclassroom.com. The first point of emphasis for the 2024 season is malicious contact. Now, in the video we made two years ago, we brought up that the NFHS baseball rules don't give a definition of malicious contact. So this year, they gave us a definition in the points of emphasis. Contact or a collision is considered to be malicious if the contact is a result of intentional excessive force and or there is intent to injure. Now, they do stress that this isn't necessarily the only scenario that can be considered malicious and that they still trust the umpires to use their judgment when determining if contact is malicious. I'll tell you that for me, one key sign that contact was malicious is if I believe the contact had the intent to dislodge the ball from a fielder. If I think that there was that intent, then I'd say go with malicious contact. Now, a couple of points to remember when it comes to enforcing malicious contact. First, 8-4-2E tells us that malicious contact always supersedes obstruction. So just because a fielder is not paying attention and is in the base path does not give the runner a right to run them over. They still cannot create malicious contact. Second, malicious contact is always an immediate dead ball. Rule 3-3-1 penalty then gives you the ability to place runners where you believe they would have ended had the malicious contact not occurred. The next point of emphasis is profanity, and they give context that I think is useful for umpires when determining where to draw the line. NFHS baseball is education-based athletics and is a direct extension of the classroom. So if the language would not be acceptable in the classroom, it's not acceptable on the field. And this isn't just limited to swear words. Any language that is profane, intimidating, insulting, demeaning, or hurtful should not be tolerated. And they are very clear that profanity spoken loud enough to be heard is profanity that needs to be dealt with immediately. So what are our options? They give us three levels of penalties, a verbal warning, a written warning, which comes with a dugout restriction, and ejection. Now, you need to know that by rule, we cannot restrict a player to the dugout for sportsmanship violations. A player can only be restricted for being an illegal substitute. And it's worth also noting that an ejected player does not have to leave the dugout. So what do we do if we have a player causing problems in the dugout? Well, if you can pick out which one it is and eject them, then go for it. But if you really want to shut down dugout issues, give a verbal warning to the coach that you need him to handle his players and his dugout. Usually, a verbal warning will be enough, but if it isn't and you're still getting remarks out of the dugout, then you have the option to restrict the coach to the dugout. This is the type of written warning that usually gets the point across and that the NFHS is pointing to as a best way for you to handle these situations. Finally, the last point of emphasis is pace of play. Now, while we don't have any rules changes for this going into 2024, they point out five strategies that they want to see enforced this season. The first is rule 6-2-2C which establishes a 20 second time limit between pitches or plays. Now they say this, but they also say that it was put in the rules more to establish a reasonable pace and rhythm and not to be like a pitch clock that we see in higher levels of baseball. Their instruction is that if we believe there is a consistent delay, then we should give a warning either to the pitcher, catcher, or coach that they need to pick up the pace. If after the warning, they are still moving slowly, 
then we can enforce the penalty. The second rule is 6-2-2 exception, which covers time between half innings. This rule states that from the last out of the previous half inning, there should be no more than one minute and 20 seconds until the first pitch of the next inning. This supersedes any preparatory pitches and requires the umpire to stay engaged between innings and keeping the pace of the defense getting onto the field. The third is rule 7-3-1, which revolves around the batter stepping out of the box. Now, I don't wanna dive into all the reasons a player can step out in this video, but generally, I wanna stress that the committee, again, is not saying to immediately enforce the first violation. Just like we do for the defense, the offensive player should be given a warning and then have it enforced on a later violation by the same player. Now, the fourth strategy they give is simply for umpires to use time management to speed up the game and to encourage the players to do so. This can be done in many small ways, but several I'll bring to your attention is managing the number of baseballs you always have and preventing delays chasing for foul balls, as well as expediting conferences. I broke down strategies for both of these in last year's videos, and you can find them in the video description. Finally, the last strategy they mention is managing excessive player conferences. So note this is not a charge conference that involves a coach, but instead would be something like a shortstop going to talk to his pitcher. Now, this is a part of the game, and the NFHS does support teammates encouraging each other, but don't let it become excessive. It shouldn't happen more than once or twice in a game, and if it starts to become excessive, step in and expedite the conclusion of the meeting, but there's not necessarily a penalty that you can enforce here immediately, just keep the game moving. So now that we've reviewed the three points of emphasis, let's jump into the related case plays. Case play number one, R2 and no outs. B1 hits a single to right field. R2 rounds third base and comes home with the throw from the outfield being cut off by the first baseman. F2 was blocking the plate, waiting for the ball, and R2 intentionally lowers his shoulder to get through the catcher who is obstructing his path. Is this A, this is legal, B, this is obstruction, the runner has a right to the base path, or C, this is obstruction, but the obstruction is superseded by the malicious contact. The result is the run does not score, and R2 is out and ejected. The correct answer here is C. Malicious contact is always going to supersede obstruction. So just because the catcher is in the way does not give the runner a right to drop his shoulder and try to go through the catcher. Malicious contact always supersedes obstruction. Case play number two. B3 swears at F2. The umpire wants B3 removed from the game, but does not feel that he needs to be suspended for an ejection. Can he restrict B3 to the dugout for the remainder of the game? The correct answer here is no. A player cannot be restricted to the dugout for sportsmanship issues. They can only be restricted for being an illegal substitute. So in this scenario, if you want him removed from the game, you're going to have to eject him. Case play number three. The defense gives up eight runs in the top of the first inning. After the inning, the coach gathers his team together in front of the dugout and tells his players to get their shit together. Is this A, this is legal so long as it is towards his own team, or B, this is not allowed? The correct answer here is B, that this is not legal and that this is violating the NFHS sportsmanship rules. Case play number four. F1, after striking out the side, yells out a profanity at the opposing team. The played umpire ejects F1. Is F1 allowed to remain in the dugout? The correct answer here is yes. In NFHS baseball, if a player is ejected, they are allowed to stay in the dugout that way they still have adult supervision since the coaches are most likely still going to be in the dugout. Case play number five. A freshman in the dugout of the hitting team is bench jockeying and making unsportsmanlike remarks. U1 sees the player making the remarks and ejects him. The freshman remains in the dugout and keeps making comments. What should the umpires do? A, eject him from the field and require that he be removed from the vicinity of the field. B, ignore him as you can't punish him any further. C, restrict his head coach to the dugout. If his head coach is already in the dugout, eject the head coach. The correct answer here is C. If you have a player that's been ejected or is already in the dugout and is making inappropriate remarks, after you've gone and given them a warning or done what you can to get them to stop, then go get the coach. Remind the coach that he's responsible for his players and his dugout. If the coach won't do it after a soft warning, then give the coach a restriction to the dugout. And if that doesn't work, then eject the coach. At some point, you'll get the point across, he needs to handle his dugout. Case play number six. 
the home team has installed a pitch clock for use during their games. They reference that the NFHS rules book establishes a 20 second time limit between pitches. Are they allowed to operate it during the game? Is the answer A, yes, they can if they can be consistent with it, B, yes, but only if both coaches agree, or C, no. The correct answer here is C. Even though this is in the rules book, we still do not have it set up that we will use this visibly during our games. So they are not allowed to use their own, even if they have it already installed at the field. So there you have it, our review of the 2024 NFHS points of emphasis. If you found this video helpful, be sure to subscribe to our channel and check out our website at umpireclassroom.com. As always, thanks so much for watching and I look forward to seeing you on the field.